Friends, if we could find our seats, I think we're about to get started. Thank you all for coming this morning. My name is Carter Sneed, and I have the great honor and pleasure of directing the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture here at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, the DeNicola Center, for those of you who don't know, uh, is an interdisciplinary center in the College of Arts and Letters here uh, that is dedicated to sharing the richness uh, of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition through teaching, research, service, and public engagement uh, across a variety of disciplines. Um, both here at Notre Dame, but also in the broader global public square. We do this through a variety of programs and initiatives, including our Soren Fellows Student Formation Program. I see a bunch of Soren Fellows in the room right now, or 500 Soren Fellows from the undergraduate and graduate and professional student populations. Uh, we provide mentoring and academic programming and other research opportunities, including summer internships. But we also host uh, an annual fall conference, which is creatively named the Fall Conference. Uh, <laughs> has been since its inception in 1999, and Professor Mansfield spoke as our keynote speaker five years ago. Um, and this year, we'll be meeting from uh, November 2nd through 4th, where we will take up the theme uh, of, and the question of persons. And uh, we'll be hearing from a wide variety of, of uh, amazing speakers. We expect about 1,000 people to come and about 150 speakers. It's the largest interdisciplinary event on campus at Notre Dame. Uh, you can learn more about our work at uh, ethicscenter.nd.edu. Today, however, I'm delighted that we're here to celebrate the release of Religious Liberty and the American Founding, Natural Rights and the Orig Original Meaning of the First Amendment Religion Clauses by my very dear friend and colleague, uh, Vincent Philip Munoz, Tocqueville Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government here at Notre Dame. The CCCG seeks to cultivate thoughtful and educated citizens by supporting scholarship and education concerning the ideas and institutions of constitutional government. Phillips' research and the work of the CCCG have made vital contributions to conversations surrounding democracy, freedom, and the common good here at Notre Dame. And we are honored to, to be able to celebrate this work here today on campus with our observation of Constitution Day. <laughs> it is a few days late, but uh, better late than never. Uh, my thanks to our esteemed guests who have joined us today for today's conversation, uh, Professors Harvey Mansfield, Michael Moreland, and the Honorable Jeffrey Sutton, as well as the friends and benefactors of the DeNicola Center and the CCCG who are able to join us today. And I'd also like to thank my dear friend Rick Garnett, uh, Professor of Law and Faculty Director of the Program on Church, State, and Society, which is also a co-sponsor of today's event. Uh, and before turning it over to our guests, uh, I'll briefly introduce our panelists and then invite Philip to offer uh, a precy of his book, at which point we'll move on to our panelists' comments and Philip's response before opening it up for questions uh, and conversation. First, uh, Professor Harvey Mansfield is the William R. Keenan Jr. Research Professor of Government at Harvard University, where he has taught for more than 60 years. He has written extensively on the discovery and development of the theory of executive power, particularly as seen in the philosophy of Niccolo Machiavelli. He was chairman of the Harvard Government Department from 1973 to 1977, has held Guggenheim and NEH fellowships, and has been a fellow at the National Humanities Center. He won the Joseph R. Levinson Award for his teaching at Harvard, and in 2004 accepted a National Humanities Medal from President Bush. His many books include translated works of Machiavelli and Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, and most recently, very recently, this week in fact, Machiavelli's Effectual Truth, Creating the Modern world, which was just published yesterday. Michael Moreland is professor of law and religion and, and uh, of law and religion and director of the Eleanor H. McCullen Center for Law, Religion and Public Policy at Villanova University, where he has served on the faculty since 2006. A renowned scholar of constitutional law, torts, bioethics and religious freedom, Professor Moreland received his BA in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame, his MA and PhD in theological ethics from Boston College, and his JD, I'm sorry about this part, from the University of Michigan Law School. <laughs> Before coming to Villanova, Professor Moreland clerked for the Honorable Paul J. Kelly Jr. of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit and was an associate at Williams and Connolly in Washington, D.C. He also served as the Marianne Remick Senior Visiting Fellow at the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture 
from 2015 to 2017. Uh, the Honorable Jeffrey Sutton is the Chief United States Circuit Judge serving on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Judge Sutton was nominated by the court by to the court by President George W. Bush and confirmed by the U.S. Senate in April of 2003. He earned his law degree, I'm even more sorry about this, from the Ohio State University <laughs> College of Law in 1990, and subsequently clerked for the Honorable Thomas Meskell of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, as well as for two Supreme Court Justices, Lewis Powell and Justice Antonin Scalia. Judge Sutton also served as Solicitor General of Ohio and is an adjunct professor of law at the Ohio State University College of Law and is a visiting lecturer at Harvard Law School. Judge Sutton has authored books and articles on a wide variety of topics, including state constitutional law and federalism. Before his confirmation of the court, he argued 12 cases in the U.S. Supreme Court and numerous cases in state Supreme Courts and the federal courts of appeal. And his daughter is a graduate student here at the University of Notre Dame. Professor Vincent Philip Munoz is the Tocqueville professor of, professor of Political Science and concurrent professor of law at the University of Notre Dame. He's also the founding director of Notre Dame's Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. He writes and teaches across the fields of constitutional law, American politics, and political philosophy, with a focus on religious liberty and the American founding. His scholarship has been cited numerous times in church state Supreme Court opinions, including by Justice Alito in Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, and by both Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Thomas in Espinoza versus Montana. Professor Munoz won a National Endowment for Humanities Fellowship to support the book we are going to hear about today, Religious Liberty and the American Founding, Natural Rights and the Original Meaning, Meanings of the First Amendment uh, Religion Clauses, published by the University of Chicago Press. Philip. Good morning. Um, you don't usually do breakfast events. It turns out free breakfast gets people <laughs> gets people out. Um, I think there's a s one seat up here if anyone wants to sit down. Um, let me begin by thanking Carter and Margaret and the whole staff of the DeNicola Center uh, for organizing today's event. Special thanks to Dr. Mansfield and Professor Moreland and Judge Sutton um, to have one's work taken seriously by such serious scholars and practitioners of American constitutionalism is uh, a real honor. So I'm deeply thankful for your willingness to, uh, to come here today. I, oh, I, I have to start with an apology to the bookstore. Um, I didn't realize they were selling copies of the book. And I just, right before the panel started, I went over and I just took one. <laughs> I'll give it back. I apologize. <laughs> I'm going to stick to my notes because I want to uh, speak very briefly. Um, I'm sure, uh, you know, after, I'm sure after uh, the panel, everyone's going to run over and buy a copy of the book and probably read it tomorrow night. So, <laughs> uh, the book attempts to answer one major question and three minor questions. Uh, the major question is, what is religious liberty? We call religious liberty our first freedom. And we say that the role of government is to secure our rights, including our right to religious liberty. But what does that mean? To address this major question, I attempt to answer uh, three sets of minor questions. First minor question. When the Founding Fathers adopted the First Amendment, what were the original meanings of the prohibition against government establishments and the protection of religious free exercise? What is an establishment of religion? What is our constitutional right of religious free exercise? Does the First Amendment demand a wall of separation? Does it demand exemptions from otherwise valid uh, laws that burden religious believers? Um, does the Free Exercise Clause, for example, uh, protect the right of polygamy for those religious adherents uh, of, who practice polygamy, you know, which of course is present in the Bible? For someone who takes originalism seriously, my answers to these questions are somewhat surprising. It turns out that the original meanings of the First Amendment religion clauses are, are unclear. For reasons I can explain if you'd like me to, and this is the middle part of the book, when the founders drafted and adopted the First Amendment, they did not clarify what an establishment of religion is, and they left undetermined what the Free Exercise Clause protects. This finding leads to my second set of minor questions. If we can't determine the First Amendment's original meanings, can we understand the underlying philosophy 
that originally animated the Constitution, including its protection of religious liberty. So whatever, whatever their differences, all the founders, when they talked about religious liberty, they called it an inalienable or unalienable, we would say inalienable natural right. So what's an inalienable natural right? How do inalienable natural rights differ from alienable natural rights? What are the philosophical and theological arguments that justify the idea of an inalienable natural right to religious liberty? So the, the book's second set of minor questions relate to political philosophy and the founders' natural rights social compact theory of government. So the, the first set of questions are um, historical, historical questions about original meaning. Second are philosophical questions. The third set of minor questions, minor question is this. If we followed the founders inalienable natural rights of religious liberty, what would result? What sort of jurisprudence would it lead to? After articulating what it means to possess an inalienable right to religious liberty, I attempt to explain the legal outcomes that would result if we applied the founders natural rights political theory to actual concrete cases. So the third set of minor questions is about constitutional law. So my answer to the larger question follows from my inquiries into constitutional history, political philosophy, and constitutional law. Uh, and the answers I think are somewhat surprising to most people. Uh, another way of saying that is they please almost no one. Uh, if we really follow the founders natural rights political philosophy, the first amendment, at least its jurisprudence, would look a lot different than what the Supreme Court has done starting in the 1940s. Uh, we would tear down the wall of separation built by liberal justices, and we would recognize that the First Amendment does not provide a constitutional right to religious individuals from exemptions from otherwise valid but burdensome laws. Uh, the larger argument of the book is that we've forgotten our first principles. We've forgotten what it means to possess an inalienable natural right. That results from um, the domination of the law by legal scholars trained at places like Ohio State and University of Michigan, for example. <laughs> Sorry, that was a cheap shot. <laughs> the results, uh, I argue, are an unprincipled jurisprudence of church and state and a misunderstanding of the Constitution. If the book is successful, uh, we'll better understand the founders, natural rights, and uh, accordingly be more thoughtful and deliberate when we try to protect our first freedom. Thank you very much. I'll speak from here. Um, uh, since uh, the sun has now moved to the left. <laughs> yeah, let's go closer to it. All right, good. Um, this is a wonderful book that Professor Munoz has written. It's a compendium of uh, consisting of evidence and quotations and comment, a compendium, a compendium that will be useful to all scholars and then general readers who want to discuss or understand that questions of religious liberty. And it's also full of originality. And uh, I'll let others treat that, but I have a few minutes and I want to make four points. One is truth, second is Puritans, third is inalienable, what does that mean? And the fourth is all individuals, the ones who have this inalienable right. So what I'll say is simple or even simple-minded, but I think it's basic. Now in the phrase, Religious liberty, what is the meaning of religion? What is your definition of religion? Do you give it some sociological function in society? Do you give it a psychological definition? It's good for your soul. That's what you get in Tocqueville. Do you give it a political definition? It brings help to democracy or republics. We use the phrase, get religion, on this subject. That means get serious about something. But the trouble is that a general definition of religion doesn't capture the truth of faith. 
I wrote a review recently of a book by John McWhorter called Woke Racism, in which he attacks racism as being religious. Uh, his definition of religion is fanatic or fanaticism, irrational fanaticism. So um, what is, and, and that <laughs> does, doesn't seem to capture the whole idea, or really the central idea of religion, that religion means to a religious person the truth, so that the only religion is the true religion. Now, if the true religion tells you, say, that there is a hell to which your fellow citizens might be damned to eternity, how are you going to treat those fellow citizens as equals? Look at racism. <clears throat> People who are racist who believe that black folks are, are inferior or even subhuman. How are they going to treat them as equals in our democracy? So the notion of hell see, tends to disappear in soft democratic societies. Then there's the related problem of atheism. according to which religion itself is an offense nowadays. This problem of atheism, in which a discussion of religion today tends to become a discussion of how to appease atheists. They want to be included in religious liberty, or at least not condemned for their unbelief. So that's religious truth. Second point, the Puritans. The Puritans are somewhat overlooked, disparaged. They're not in our book here. <laughs> uh, to be called puritanical, that's not a compliment. And yet, uh, let's look at Tocqueville's famous book on democracy in America the second chapter of which is on the Puritans. And it said there that the Puritans were uh, are, uh, the point of departure from Americans. The Puritans taught us how to live democratically together in a small society. And also that this small society should be responsible for public education. Um, the place I come from, Harvard, was founded to teach the clergy, Puritan clergy, that was in 1636. So the Puritans were a kind of theocracy in which there was not much difference between political law and religious law. The problem is, though, is religious liberty, say, does that imply a society which has clusters of peoples who come from a certain religious faith like ours. So in the alma mater of Harvard, uh, there's a phrase, Puritan stock, implying that's a good thing. Our woke administrators recently deleted it, but still, it's a fact that it began as a Puritan institution. Practicing religion together, what is that? Um, is it to make a public or a society or a community of religious believers, which would mean believers in the same religion, or is it a society of individuals, each of them choosing his own religion. Third point, inalienable. The inalienable natural right of religious liberty. And Professor Munoz uh, catalogs a number of references to this inalienable right. 
um, but um, this is contrary to the social contract liberalism of the 17th century, especially the liberalism of John Locke, so important for the American founding. In that liberalism, there's a distinction made between a natural liberty and a civil liberty. A natural liberty is inalienable, it's unlimited, but it's insecure because everybody else has the same liberty. So you couldn't really have a society of people with full, unalienable, natural rights because none of them would ever cede to another. You would have a state of war. So John Locke spoke of a state of nature, which is a state of war. On the other hand, civil liberty is secure. Not uh, endangered by your fellow citizens with uh, who coming at you for their natural liberties. It's secure, but it's limited. And it's limited because it's alienated. You alienate part of your natural liberty, or maybe all of it, this is uh, disputed, <laughs> in order to get security. It's a trade-off of liberty for secure liberty. Secure liberty also being limited liberty. Now, Professor Munoz speaks of the notion of boundaries in his book that it was always supposed by those who claimed a natural right of li religious liberties that there was a boundary to it. But um, that, uh, but that's, that's difficult to understand because in the United States, okay, you've got natural right and then you've got a distinction between constitutional law and ordinary law. Constitutional law, only the people can change, supposedly, but that's the formal principle. Ordinary law, only Congress can change, not the people, not directly the people. So with us, the Constitution is a kind of alienation of individuality. It begins, we the people, not me the individual. We the people. Yeah. And the two clauses of the Constitution, <clears throat> which uh, do set boundaries to relig religious liberty, say, are, as you know, no establishment. There must be no established religion and no official no official religion, okay. so that's a kind of check on religion. But then on the other hand, free exercise of religion is guaranteed. And that's an encouragement of religion. Fourth, all individuals have the natural right of religious liberty. All individuals, well, wouldn't there be common sense exceptions? What about aliens? And what about children? I focus on children, forget the aliens. Children have to be educated. When they're born, they are totally dependent and you gradually educate them to use uh, in a disciplined and useful way, their independence. So religion, the children have to be educated. Doesn't religious liberty require education? It isn't just something that you're born with or which you simply think about. And the education seems to require authority. This is a general problem of liberalism. Liberalism questions authority. Who says that you're my boss? No. It questions authority in the name of 
it, uh, because it questions tradition and superstition and prejudice, all of which have held sway over this over us because of authority. So religion needs authority to be taught, taught that needs to teach its beliefs, its dogmas, its rituals. And these are all to one religion as the true religion. Which is it? Which is more important, religion or liberty? For religion, you're taught these beliefs and most appropriately in a parochial school. For liberty, you're taught toleration in a public school. Which is better? How do we mix these opposite things? Which do we stress? Which comes first? Notre Dame or Ohio State? <laughs> Thanks. Well, it's hard to top that ending, but I... <laughs> I want to thank. Uh, Stop playing to the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank uh, uh, Carter and his staff for organizing this event, and to uh, Philip for uh, writing this wonderful book, and to my co-panelists and to all of you for being here. This is actually the second time I've had the honor of commenting on uh, Philip's book. The first time uh, was in early March 2020 uh, when he delivered the lectures that became the basis of this book at Princeton, and uh, that was early March 2020, which now feels like a decade ago, but um, it's wonderful to see it <clears throat> between two covers. So my remarks here are uh, sort of framed about around what I'll call the magisterial and the mundane. Uh, the magisterial is the wonderful work that Philip has done here <clears throat> to uh, treat the American founding <clears throat> with regard to religious liberty and the philosophical underpinnings of it. Uh, the reader of this book will get a, a great education in natural rights theory, uh, learn a lot about state constitutionalism at the time of the founding, a topic near and dear to Judge Sutton's heart, uh, and also learn a lot about issues of constitutional interpretation, contemporary debates about originalism, constitutional construction, and the like. That's the magisterial part. I'm here to talk about more mundane issues, uh, particularly with regard to the last part of the book, which deals with the application of Philip's work to some contemporary church state issues where I at least have some questions, not objections, at least some questions. Uh, Philip is rightly circumspect about the extent to which his natural rights view should simply push aside settled uh, constitutional interpretations around the First Amendment uh, and, and replace them. Uh, and that's all well and good. But if Philip's account is correct, we are, I think, at a minimum living in a second best constitutional order. And here I want to focus, though, on two areas where I think the doctrine of current First Amendment law is sharply at odds with Philip's account. Uh, one he discusses briefly and one he does not. And just kind of see what, what he makes of it and what, what we make of it. So the first uh, is with regard to the issue of the ministerial exception and related church autonomy doctrines, uh, about which uh, Notre Dame's own Rick Garnett in the back there is a great expert. So the basic idea is that the First Amendment protects an institutional right of religious institutions to be free from government interference in the selection of employees who perform significant religious functions, not merely ordained clergy, but also teachers and others with significant leadership roles. Now, Philip's view in the book is that while <clears throat> the government can't play a role in selecting ministers because the natural rights establishment clause imposes a jurisdictional bar on such direct interference with the church. Nonetheless, he rejects, so far as I can tell, the contemporary uh, Supreme Court and, and all the lower court's view about the ministerial exception because Philip's view is that incidental effects on such selection of ministerial employees, such as through the operation of non-discrimination requirements, are not forbidden. Uh, and so this also seems to be an Establishment Clause cousin to Philip's strong non-exemption view about the Free Exercise Clause, about which I'll stay, say more 
in a moment. So it, essentially, the, again, the, the settled view of the unanimous Supreme Court decision from about a decade ago is that the First Amendment in a kind of conjunction of both free exercise and establishment principles forbids the state from adjudicating civil courts, for instance, from adjudicating, say, employment discrimination lawsuits. It's why, for instance, <clears throat> the Catholic Church can uh, not ordain women or Orthodox Jewish synagogues can not ordain women to the rabbinate uh, and they aren't subject to employment discrimination suits because uh, notwithstanding the fact that those uh, Title VII and other state employment non-discrimination rules are, are neutral and generally applicable, nonetheless, they can't be applied to churches because of this principle of the ministerial exception. Now, I think things are more complicated than perhaps the account here of the Natural Rights Establishment Clause might say. In, I think in uh, church autonomy doctrines, and the ministerial exception is one of others. There are intra-church property disputes, for example, where it arises, but ministerial exception is, uh, I think, the most important, is not merely an anti-establishment requirement or an instance of a free exercise exemption, but is instead a standalone principle in church-state doctrine born of protection for institutional, collective, religious liberty. And here the Chief Justice's opinion in Hosanna Tabor, for example, cites to ancient principles of libertas ecclesiae, the rights of the English church, dating back to uh, uh, documents such as Magna Carta. And so far as I can tell, Philip's natural rights account of religious liberty uh, has a hard time taking cognizance of those aspects of our religious freedom jurisprudence. And F Philip, in fairness, might say, well, all the worse for them. But I do think that there is, in the background of the First Amendment, perhaps, arguably, uh, a kind of principle of institutional religious autonomy, subject to certain limitations, of course, uh, but that that is not or can't really be uh, taken cognizance of by certain aspects of the natural rights view that Philip has on offer, but is nonetheless part of our constitutional tradition, part of the tradition of the framers at the time of the drafting of the First Amendment and is very much alive and well in current uh, Supreme Court and other court doctrine. And I suspect here, I'm curious uh, about Philip's reaction, that maybe something of what's going on here is that Philip's social contract natural rights account is most at home with regard to the rights of individuals who have natural rights of individual uh, you know, over and against uh, state encroachment. And that it is harder on that kind of social contractarian view to think about what might be rights of religious institutions uh, to be free from government interference in certain kinds of situations. Because after all, individuals are natural things uh, and institutions and collections of persons such as churches are artificial things. But nonetheless, I think can genuinely be right and duty bearing entities uh, in our constitutional tradition. The second area, and I'll be a little briefer here so that we can have the discussion, is the way in which Philip's view, uh, as he discussed uh, very briefly in his opening remarks, uh, takes the view associated with the Supreme Court's decision of Employment Division versus Smith in 1990 that the First Amendment's free exercise clause admits of no constitutional right of exemption from neutral and generally applicable law. Fair enough, and there's a vibrant debate in the literature that the book uh, very magisterially summarizes debates between scholars such as Michael McConnell and Philip Hamburger, uh, Justice Alito's concurrence in the Fulton versus City of Philadelphia case in which he calls for overturning uh, Employment Division versus Smith and arguing for an originalist understanding of the First Amendment's free exercise clause as requiring such exemptions or at least subjecting uh, uh, impositions on religious liberty to heightened scrutiny. Uh, and fair enough, I, I don't think that uh, one need necessarily uh, take full issue with Philip's endorsement of the Smith rule as consistent with his natural rights uh, view of the First Amendment. Nonetheless, I do think that the current Supreme Court doctrine on this area is a little more complicated. I think there's a tendency sometimes to think about these issues as though exemptionism was an on-off switch that either you go full on with the pre-Smith regime of strict scrutiny for claims of religious exemption, or uh, you take the Smith rule that neutral and generally applicable laws admit of no constitutional right whatsoever. In part because I think the current doctrine on this area has called attention to the ways in which those, neut those requirements of neutral neutrality and general applicability are indeed more complicated. 
that, for instance, in instances where the uh, where law has in place mechanisms for individualized review for potential exemptions, or where a law gives exemptions for secular reasons but refuses to give an exemption for religious reasons. And this has resulted in the COVID cases, for example, the COVID closure cases in Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, for, uh, where I hail from, uh, where the, uh, the city had in place a mechanism for granting exemptions from its non-discrimination requirements, but refused to grant that exemption to Catholic social services in the foster care context. And the court unanimously, although divided as to the justification, held that the very fact of the ability to, to craft such individualized exemptions subjected the law to strict scrutiny, which it could not satisfy. So again, I think here that, um, that uh, the, the, the current doctrine has evolved in ways that are more complicated than perhaps the, the view that Philip discusses in the last part of the book has admitted, and in which, again, we don't have to take a full-on pro-exemption view, but nonetheless can say that the, the fact that the government has in place, for instance, mechanisms for individualized exemptions means uh, that in those instances where they have been then been denied to religious institutions, that uh, that, that kind of uh, conduct by the government should be subject to some form of heightened scrutiny. So again, this, none of this is meant to say that what Philip has done here is anything less than a magisterial summary of the founding and of the natural rights understanding of the First Amendment that he offers us. I do think, though, that in these two areas in particular, one with regard to the ministerial exception, where he takes a view at the end of the book that uh, non-targeted but incidental impingements upon the ability of churches to select their ministers, uh, so far as I can tell, uh, Philip's views holds that, uh, the, those, that the current doctrine with regard to the ministerial exception is unjustified. I think that the, our constitutional tradition has other strains in it, including strains coming out of the English experience with regard to the freedom of the church that, are, that sit at odds with that. And then with regard to exemptionism, which in many ways is the most contested current debate uh, in First Amendment law, I do think that the kind of on-off view about that issue and saying that merely neutrality and general applicability are all that's required has been significantly complicated by the Supreme Court, in my, in my view, quite admirably, by saying that there are actually lots of instances of failure of general, general applicability, and where those failure, failures of general applicability are present, rights of religious exemption should come to the fore. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, yesterday I was uh, visiting some law school classes and came up uh, the conversations about the game and then I'd gone to Ohio State and it occurred to me that Notre Dame is quite good at um, for exercise of religion but not so much freedom of you know cheering for the team you'd like to. Uh, <laughs> I was told that I should not wear red and uh, quiet would be good uh, so I'm gonna do my best. Uh, I'm <laughs> and I did say I would pay for my ticket. Uh, that's true. Uh, that's true. Um, well, anyway, truly good luck. My daughter and future son-in-law are here, so I'm, I'm actually quite ambivalent. Um, you know, I, I, Philip, I really enjoyed the book, um, and every, everyone should read it, particularly the, the students. Um, it's so accessible. He's so clear about where he's going. He's very specific. At pages 255 and 272, he tells you exactly how his theory applies to the big cases, which I just loved. So, uh, you know, buy it and pay for it uh, would be my uh, my recommendation. Um, well, you know, where you stand on a point um, often depends on where you sit, and I sit as a judge, and I think that probably distinguishes my remarks from an American historian, religious liberty scholar, and someone who tries to referee these disputes for a living. And, and let me make just three um, basic points. Um, the work, like a lot of works, um, uh, focuses on federal con law. The one thing a federal judge knows when you talk about something that's focused exclusively on federal con law is it's the federal judges that are gonna ultimately answer the question. That doesn't mean me, that means five out of nine justices on the US Supreme Court. And, and, you know, the one thing that troubles me about American constitutional law today is we're just so obsessed about the composition of the court and, frankly, have delegated 
far more authority to them than anyone could have imagined. So it's very strange to have a think about original public meaning, how natural law applied to the Constitution, and then ignore this just bonkers idea that five out of nine justices would construe an unamendable Constitution and you'd have no way to replace them. I mean, that, that, that's the part of this that seems to me not remotely consistent with original public meaning. And I can illustrate the point. You know, the U.S. Constitution doesn't specifically say federal judges get the final say over the meaning of the Constitution. But it's correct that that's the right answer. And the reason we know that's what they meant in 1789 is that before 1789, the state courts construing their own constitutions have been trying to figure out how judicial review worked and do judges have the final say over whether a piece of legislation was good law. And the state courts across the board agreed that judicial review was a good idea. In fact, they thought it was their duty. It was simply a conflict of laws problem. You have a statute on one hand, constitution on the other. If they conflicted, the judge had to honor the higher law of the constitution. That's very supportive of judicial review. On the other hand, how did they exercise this? With considerable humility. In both directions of the conflict, they would try to avoid the conflict if possible. If they could construe the statute to avoid the conflict, they would do that. If they decided the meaning of the Constitution was not sufficiently clear to create this conflict, the law survived. We have so lost track of that original approach to how to think about federal constitutional law. And I think, you know, one thing that's great about this book is it tells you how to think about this from the outset. It's just, um, Philip, where were you in 1803? Uh, I mean, we, it, it would have been nice to do this then. And there is so much water over the dam. Uh, so when you read the, the cases on 255 and 272 that you realize our intention with natural law, natural law, original public meaning, you realize, well, this is going to be hard to deal with. And I, I think my other slight skepticism, and again, this is the judge bias, I had felt that the court, whether true original public meaning or not, was getting to a fairly understandable place, prioritizing neutrality in both directions, but not being afraid to scrutinize very carefully whether it was neut neutral or not, which seems to me is what happened in the COVID cases. The court was very careful about making sure these laws truly were neutral, particularly these emergency orders. So there's a part of me that just thinks, hey, we're doing pretty well right now. It's getting understandable. That's good for everybody. So that gave me slight skepticism. My second point of three, by the way, I'm doing three. So first had four, second two, I have three. We'll say I'm embracing the Trinity. Um, why are we so obsessed with the idea that a right doesn't count, a principle, a value doesn't count unless it's constitutionalized? I, I've just never understood that. Why don't we as Americans prioritize, say, the 1964 Civil Rights Act over Brown? I mean, the goal of a society like ours should be that the majority, as a matter of legal, political, social culture, decides that it's a very good idea to look after minorities, dissenters, whatever it might be. That's what's so heroic about the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And focusing just on federal constitutional protections, needed though they are, obscures that point. And I must say, if, if, if your sole goal is religious liberty, if that is what you think about as you wake up each morning, Think a little bit about what type of measure is more likely to get you relief in cases in the courts, an unamendable constitution or democratically enacted law. So that's the beauty of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, which was passed after Smith in opposition to Smith. Um, little slight sidestep, not enforceable against the states in all settings, but after that, I mean, I've had this conversation with Mike McConnell, and he, he agrees with me on this point. If you have strict scrutiny being applied to a law as required by a statute versus strict scrutiny applied to a law as required by a constitution, I bet you every day the judge is going to be much more willing 
to follow the statutory strict scrutiny than the constitutional strict scrutiny. And that's because statutory strict scrutiny can be fixed. You know, you, ask, you have to ask yourself, what's the risk of error? And the risk of error is tremendous with the Constitution because you can't amend it and you can't change the composition of the court. But if the federal judges overstep in construing a statute, Congress can return to the scene of the crime and fix things. So in many ways, it's, it's quite counterintuitive. It's truly more counter-majoritarian to rely on the majoritarian law, the statute, because I think it's going to be much more aggressively enforced. And if you look at the U.S. Supreme Court's cases enforcing RIFRA, I think you'll agree with me. The court is not afraid to apply strict scrutiny. And the third point, a hobby horse of mine, which I can't resist, but, but the book just kind of reinforces the point for me. It's so difficult to figure out how to construe these general terms. In that world, if we like judges and like judicial review, why would we f have just one? And why would we focus on just one? We have 51 constitutions in this country. As Philip points out, the U.S. Constitution was modeled after the early state constitutions. Those state constitutions remain in place, remain enforceable. They all have free exercise protections. In fact, they're often quite a bit more elaborate. They refer to rights of conscience in most cases. And so one reason not to focus just on the U.S. Supreme Court is first we have statutory options, but the other option is using state courts, construing state constitutions as a second option. And, and that's where I will say, I mean, the natural law point gets very complicated. I mean, that's, that maybe is your next book or we'll co-write it together. Because you have to ask yourself, you know, when Arizona put its constitution together, was it thinking a lot about natural law? I don't think so. So there's been a big evolution as these 50 constitutions, which are very amendable, changed throughout American history. But we should just not lose, lose, sight, of, lose sight of those. But uh, it's an honor to be here. I'll be happy in a way if you win tomorrow. Um, but now ask yourself, can you say the same thing to me? <laughs> <laughs>
Professor Moreland's main comment is, um, look, the, the natural rights view, whatever it is, you might be right, Professor Munoz, but it's, it's not enough protection. It, you know, the ministerial exception, now what's going on here is Professor Moreland's trying to get me in trouble with Professor Garnett. <laughs> <laughs> the, the ministerial exception doesn't offer sufficient protection given the modern regulatory state non-discrimination law. Uh, that might be true. Um, I, I'm sympathetic to that argument. Um, it might be the original meaning of the, con the original meaning of the Constitution, or the Constitution more generally, isn't meant to solve all problems. And it may not solve some of our current problems. It might say the solution to the current problems, and this is to go back to uh, Judge Sutton's comment, the solution to the co our current problems is not in the Constitution, but with our state representatives or, our, or through passing laws to supplement the Constitution. I, it's an error to think the Constitution is meant to pro prohibit all evils. The work of the free exercise clause and the establishment clause are relatively limited. They are meant to take certain things off the table. That might not be enough to protect religious liberty. So we may need supplementary statutes like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Right? So it's really a different understanding or approach to the protection of rights. Um, some rights are protected, a very few rights are protected in the Constitution, but then Congress is supposed to, or state governments are also supposed to protect rights in modern situations where the Constitution doesn't account for them. So I'm sympathetic to actually Professor Moreland's point. I'm just, the ministerial exception and other such things um, may not be provided for through the First Amendment, but they can be provided for through the process of constitutional government statutes, supplementary statutes, which I think is what Judge Sutton is actually asking for. Okay, Professor Mansfield's uh, comments let me see if I can translate them for everyone. This is what I took from them at least. I heard him channeling his inner Leo the 13th, something I, something I thought I'd never say about you before. <laughs> yeah. um, can you really be a religious believer and be committed to religious liberty? Shouldn't a religious believer be committed to religious truth? Truth, not tolerance, is the perspective of a religious believer. It's the, that's the heart of the matter. Moreover, doesn't a commitment to religious liberty undermine religion in the long run, channeling his inner Patrick Deneen? Well, so aren't the Puritans in a way, right, what we should aspire to or what the religious believer should aspire to, right? Uh, that's how I took um, uh, all three of the comments. I think the argument here, and it's chapter three in the book where I address this, um, an adequate response requires the belief that religious truth itself and the pursuit of religious truth requires um, sufficient freedom for the religious believer, that the religious believer can only reach religious truth through freedom. That is the essential theological teaching that's necessary for religious freedom. To put it in a different way, I did this with my, my students this week. Ultimately, the argument for religious freedom requires a theological commitment that the creator who created us wants, to love him, wants us to love him freely. So there has to be a theological grounding to religious freedom. So truth and tolerance coincide. If that's true, you can be committed both to religious truth and to religious freedom. If that's not true, you can't. One note on inalienable rights. Um, this was a, um, I think the effectual truth of the comment was, there are no inalienable rights. And that's true for Hobbes. It's true that Locke doesn't use the term, as far as I know, inalienable rights. Um, but James Madison does. And so this is an innovation. This is one of the innovations that Professor Mansfield uh, referred to. And in this sense, the innovation, to put both my comments together, the innovation of James Madison and the founders, which I think actually anticipates the argument of dignitas humanae, is that um, 
we can both love God and love our country if um, the love of God is this facilitated and allowed by the state we create. That state will be limited in its aims, limited in its aims vis-a-vis -vis religious truth because the truth must be proceed must be pursued freely that state authorities are not given the same authority as the church. Okay, before we open the floor to questions, I just want to make sure our panelists uh, that say something briefly in response if they wish, but they don't have to, no pressure. Okay, great, let's open the floor to questions. Um, when I call on you, um, just tell us your name and, uh, and please ask your question. We'd like to start with a student. Uh, so please, one of our Soren fellows, one of our students, please ask a question. If you don't, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> See you wearing Soren fellow t-shirts. You can't hide from me. Someone, okay, you have a question? Okay, here we go. Tell us your name. Yes, yes. Um, Abraham Figueroa, he, he, he wants to know, so he knows this. Professor Mansfield grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and his father taught at Ohio State uh, the Ohio State University, if I may. Not. So are you really rooting for Ohio State? That's what Abraham wants to know. Oh, uh, in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> not, any, not anymore. <laughs> All right, let's open the floor to questions. Anybody, non-students, anybody who has a question, please. Uh, yes, sir, tell us your name. Great. Great. So the question is, when judges and other officials, federal officials, take an oath to uphold the Constitution, the question is what are they what are they swearing to uphold in light of the conversation today? Can I take this one? Because I want to echo something that Judge Sutton said, which is um, we tend to think, I, this is part of the, what I took from his comments, we tend to think that it's the role of the judge to enforce the Constitution and its limits. And if I understood Judge Sutton's right, and saying, well, that's true, but it's not the whole truth, that the Congress, members of Congress and the President, they too take oaths of office to uphold the Constitution, that they have responsibilities to protect the Constitution, that not all of our constitutional freedoms can be protected only by judges. In fact, it's somewhat silly to think we allow five judges to, to have final say when everyone else is a constant. All federal officers are constitutional officers, right? And so one of the things they, um, in their oath of office to uphold the Constitution is to respect its limits. So a, a, a congressman who says, well, I'm going to pass this legislation, whether it's constitutional or not, and if it's unconstitutional, the court can tell me. That's a failure to do one's, one's duty. At least that's part of what I took the judge to be saying. I, oh, I quite agree with that point. I think the question's a little easier to answer for what the Constitution refers to as an inferior judge. Uh, so the Court of Appeals and District Court judges are inferior judges as opposed to the Supreme Court justices. So for me, um, part of that answer has to be agree, you know, agreeing to follow the U.S. Supreme Court decisions, whether I agree with them or not. I think it's a much more complicated answer for the Supreme Court justice because it's, they've got a lot more latitude to overrule decisions. And one would think a Supreme Court justice would be um, swearing out an oath to uphold the written document. And that doesn't seem like a big stretch. And if it's the written document, that means it has a fixed meaning, and if it has a fixed meaning, why you should be doing what Professor Munoz says, seeing what the natural law original public meaning was. Um, now, all Supreme Court justices are going to, well, all but, well, Justice Thomas, it's a little complicated, but the other eight for sure are going to pay attention to reliance interests in society, and that's why, you know, every case doesn't start with going back to square one. Um, but it's a, it's a really wonderful question. It makes me think you're a judge. You've thought about it. <laughs> uh, if I can just say, uh, 
the oath is not simply to uh, serve and protect the Constitution. I've taken the oath, uh, by the way, when I joined the U.S. Army, and later on uh, in Washington when I um, became a member of a purely honorary uh, committee um, that I got because I was a Republican. <laughs> um, it's uh, serve and protect the Constitution and defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That gave me big ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in the back. Tell us your name. question is, what is an oath without the enforcement of that oath or without a mechanism to enforce the oath is the question, yes? From Eddie, a 1L. Mike, Professor Moreland, you haven't said anything yet. Well, I, I cheekily want to say there are, there are uh, penalties seen and unseen sometimes right, <laughs> in life, but also that um, I think uh, the founders and I hope still today there's a view that uh, people of virtue are – uh, necessary in these high offices taking these oaths and that uh, the, um, the, those who take them and then need coercion in order to do what is right uh, shouldn't have the office in the first place. Yeah, the, the enforcement mechanism is that if you, if you take the oath and you're an elected representative at least and you fail to live up to it and don't respect the Constitution, the people enforce it by voting you out of office. But for that to happen, the people have to know the Constitution and know their rights. So, which, which is why you should be a constitutional studies minor. Uh, yes, here. Tell us your name. Uh, I'm Matthew Spillar. So, my question is more primarily for Judge Tuckman to be a judge of federal law. Uh, how important is it for us to look at the original meaning of the First Amendment back in the 18th century, considering? situations like the ministerial exception that might not have necessarily been contemplated by the founders in the way that we think of it today because I mean my understanding would be that the idea that there would be federal anti-discrimination law in 1800 is ridiculous or unimportant. So uh, yeah, so like what's the importance of looking to it then and to what extent does the understanding of it make sense? Great, great question. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't think I have a, a terrific answer to it. I mean, the, the one thing that um, I, I have to say originalists probably were a little sloppy with was what became expectations originalism. In other words, uh, something was happening. I, I suspect Professor Munoz would say this about our acceptance of prayer in legislative settings, prayer in graduations. Because if you thought um, what the practices were indicated what the expectations were and the expectations proved original meaning, that would justify a lot of decisions. Greece, Marsh, would show Lee versus Weissman's wrong. Um, but you're, you're, it's not clear that exceptions originalism is the right way to think about it. Um, and, I, and I must say, I go back to where I started with my remarks. I do think the way the first state court judges were looking at this they were onto something that, yes, they had judicial review authority, but there was nothing wrong with trying to ameliorate the conflict when they could. And I, I think that helps throughout. Um, the, the other feature of this very mischievous question, I must say, is um, it's, it's, I guess it's Professor Gerges's living traditionalism. I mean, can we decide that as traditions change and get uniform, that changes the meaning of the Constitution, thinks substantive due process, perhaps privileges and immunities. I'm actually, I would be happy to throw an olive branch to my progressive friends and say, okay, I'll go for this as long as we have real evidence that this norm is 
it has just a handful of outliers. But none of this, you know, saying everyone's doing it when 20 states are doing it. But I, I don't, you know, the Ramos case is a good example. There was one outlier left with unanimous juries. Uh, the country's not going to fall apart when the U.S. Supreme Court nationalizes a right that 49 states recognize. So that's a way in which the living part of it goes forward, which is seems pretty strange and quite inconsistent with a fixed constitution. So that's not my cup of tea. I only went down this road in an olive branch way, but we're tomorrow not going to be doing olive branches, so probably we should just stop <laughs> there. Uh, <laughs> I would say that the original meaning is the meaning. And you know, if you change that, it should be understood to be changed. But uh, the original problems that the meaning of the Constitution addressed can change. The Constitution, when, uh, when formulated and adopted, was especially meant to um, check the usurpation of the legislature. No, that doesn't seem to be our problem. <laughs> Why do we need to inspire and animate the legislature? So uh, that, that's the way that things can change under the same meaning. But if, if, if it's a new meaning, it shouldn't be called living. And it's really a kind of dying rather than living. Uh, Deacon Forbes. My question is, the definition of a constitutional right, in other words, if we think about Lessie versus Ferguson, think about Roe v. Wade, the idea is that whatever the Constitution and how it's determined by the Supreme Court grants a constitutional right, every decision of the court is considered to be entirely a constitutional right. Are you talking to me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I tend to think that we, um, I mean, you can use the word right in a lot of ways, but I do tend to think we obsess over individual rights. It's a very American phenomenon for the last 70 or 80 years. And I, I think most of us, if we think about it, would appreciate that the far more important cases at the U.S. Supreme Court are about structure about who decides, you know, who, who is, is this a role for the courts? Is this a role for Congress? Is this a role for the states? And I personally think that's where judges should be keeping their focus. And I would guess that was what was anticipated at the outset. I want to just follow up again on what Professor Mansfield said about its fixed meaning. Um, the whole problem in federal con law is twofold. It's very difficult to amend the federal constitution, hardest in the world to amend. And as a result, you know, we put so much pressure on the U.S. Supreme Court essentially to amend it by interpretation recently. The second problem is we forgot our early tradition of actually amending it. Political, there was a time in this country where political parties saw it as advantageous that they had to go through trench warfare state by state in order to get something passed. And, you know, it's true. It took a long time for those things to happen. But when you went through that process, it was a stable right. And when it's an amendment by interpretation, there's nothing stable about it at all. It's a function of the composition of the court. And so, um, and this, by the way, is why at the state level, they don't have this problem. Their constitutions are amendable by 51%. So the idea of living constitutionalism is absurd at the state level because if you want it to live, just amend it. So we've just played this game really ever since the 60s. And I, I sometimes wish the ERA had passed because we, instead of the lesson that you can get what you wanted through the U.S. Supreme Court, see U.S. versus Virginia, the lesson would have been if you work at it, you'll change this constitutional provision. It won't be up to the courts, and it will now be locked in because once you change it, it's locked in. And somehow we've got to recapture that tradition. We have time for one, one last question. Uh, yes, in the very back. Tell us your name.
understand the question. Yeah, the, the question was um, about uh, the authority of lawmakers to uh, and when passing generally applicable laws and the and the boundaries of rights. Um, uh, the Aztec practice of sacrificing children clearly no one's going to allow that. But what about peyote use, which is illegal, but some religions, you know, it, really, I guess the question is really about the boundaries of rights uh, and the boundaries of the right to religious free exercise. Um, uh, I think Professor Mansfield and I might have a disagreement here. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to, to ask you of this. Um, my understanding of the founders' understanding is that they held that all natural rights have natural limits because Alexander Hamilton says um, natural rights are part of the natural law. Let me use a couple of simple examples. Um, uh, libel is saying false things about someone, right? So your right to free speech does not include, the right of free speech does not include libel. Free speech doesn't mean you can say anything. Rights are not unlimited or unbounded. This is, uh, Professor Mansfield referred to this. The boundaries of a natural right are actually the natural law. You can't say false things about someone. You don't have a right to say that. So the, the boundaries of the natural right to religious liberty are also the natural law. You can't say, I have a religious obligation to, to sacrifice children. All of this presupposes, however, that there's a harmony between faith and reason. That is, that the commands of the divine law do not are consistent with the commands of the natural law. So you can have natural law limitations on the natural right or natural law boundaries on the natural right to religious liberty. Now, in specific cases, the question is going to be, well, is peyote against the natural law? I mean, you know, the further you get away from the natural law, the, the Thomas Aquinas says, right, the first precepts of the natural law are clear. The further you move away, concrete cases, the more difficult it is. The way I would approach your question is to say, we have, we have to think through what what um, what is in the content of a natural right, understanding that natural rights have natural limits. But here I break with Hobbes and perhaps Locke, or I'd say the founders break with certainly with Hobbes and perhaps Locke, and that the founders, at least in my interpretation of them, I think Professor Mansfield might disagree here, I see the founders as, um, I suspect, much more as natural law theorists than perhaps Professor Mansfield does. Okay, uh, I just, what is the meaning of inalienable? Inalienable means it cannot be taken away from you. If you have a right to religious liberty, it cannot be taken away from you. So um, if there are boundaries to that, it's you who interprets them. You are the judge of what cannot be taken away from you. Otherwise, the person who is the judge say, is taking over what is inalienable. So uh, a situation, therefore, in which everybody has an inalienable right is, uh, to put it mildly, uh, uh, temporary. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that cannot last, and this was as uh, the state of nature, a state of war, or a state of conflict, which I think you get in both mm -hmm. Hobbes and Locke. So, so yes, I think um, you know, the, the, the idea of an inalienable natural right as still uh, as having natural boundaries and still being uh, uh, viable in civil society, that, that would be something new, I think. Yeah, this is so the I'm difference between uh, 17th century liberalism yeah. and uh, and the American founding. Perhaps, that. perhaps this is the difference between the uh, trying to capture the truth and trying to understand the effectual truth. Well, we'll right. have to buy <laughs> Professor Mansfield's books to figure that out, which came out yesterday. So please buy both Professor Munoz and <laughs> Professor Mansfield's books. Buy my books too. Buy everybody's <laughs> books. That's the whole point of what we're doing here. Um, I'd like to, friends, I'd like to thank you once again. Um, uh, thank you for coming. I'd like to thank our panelists. I'd especially like to thank the staff of the CCCG for their assistance in coordinating the logistics of today's event. Don Stelludo, Debbie O'Malley, Zane Mabry, and Jen Smith, as well as the extraordinary staff of the DeNicola Center, and in particular, Margaret Cabanis, Justin Petrasek, and Brooke Tranton, uh, as well as the entire staff uh, for all their hard work 
behind the scenes. Copies of Philip's book are available for sale um, with, for, for money um, from the uh, Notre Dame bookstore display to my left. And the Soren Fellows of the De Nicola Center uh, can approach our staff uh, for a free copy. And perhaps Professor Munoz will be willing to sign them for you. Many thanks again for joining us and enjoy your weekend. Thanks.